in, in order to maybe give a very high level idea of like how what i am going to discuss in this talk is like uh, just i uh, here we propose a uh, atomic swap which is suitable for lightweight applications uh, so like you can do it on your have an app in your mobile phone and also you can do that and also like uh, the talk in which uh, elizabeth uh, discussed this e ethereum versus monero so he there this uh, the guy who is locking ethereum has to move first so this could be a possibility of uh, griefing attack on ethereum because till the timeout is over one cannot unlock the ethereum so it's the same here so if the guy who moves first locks the bitcoin so if, if the other party is not locking monero then the bitcoin cannot be unlocked after this given time also since monero doesn't support time locks so we are not going into some heavy crypto stuffs for that and we uh, mainly focus on this uh, secret uh, sharing thing uh, so it doesn't require a time lock on the monero side and the main idea which we use uh, is the use of adapter signatures so we show that how you can partially sign a trans transaction and this later could be validated using uh, some sharing some part of the secret and that leads to the acceptance of the transaction and leading to a successful swap or a refund on either of the chain so so now let me discuss like how this uh, conventional atomic swap works so the first atomic swap which is proposed is an hdlc based uh, atomic swap by tier nolan in 2013. so uh, how is, uh, it could work like uh, uh, monero uh, uh, could be locked in this uh, maybe there's a script which is uh, supported on the monero chain that's this considered for as example so I'll just, just lock Sir Monero in there and uh, it may be giving it a timeout of 48 hours. And Bob also has an account in this Monero chain. So he uh, he checks whether Alice has successfully locked the coins or not. And also he checks that uh, he needs to give a pre-image for a particular hash. And uh, so he uses this hash again in his uh, Bitcoin blockchain. So he instantiates a smart contract where he locks his uh, Bitcoins in this particular address. And also we consider that Alice has an account in this Bitcoin blockchain. And also he assigns a timeout less than what Alice has assigned. So like uh, we consider like he assigns a timeout half of what Alice had done. So he says, okay, like after 24 hours, if Alice is not giving me the pre-image, I just unlock my Bitcoins. So now Alice, uh, if she wants to initiate the swap, she releases the pre-image X and then Bob uh, claims the Bitcoin from Bob. And in turn, Bob gets this pre-image X and he gets the coins from Alice. So this is like in the good case of Alice in case wants uh, the swap to go through. And in case Alice is not happy and this wants a refund so she can just uh, sit uh, quiet and doesn't don't respond for the next 24 hours so like after the 24 hours bob just unlocks his uh, bitcoins and after the 48 hour uh, alice will unlock her monero so sounds good i mean this is a very simple protocol and uh, so let's see like why this sort of thing doesn't work uh, for this combination of uh, monero and bitcoin i think it's, it was also discussed in the previous presentation so as i mentioned that uh, monero scripting doesn't support uh, use of hash lock and time lock okay so time lock with a pinch of salt because uh, there are certain papers which discusses like how you can make uh, use of time lock puzzles or verifiable time signatures uh, for practical cases but as we mentioned as i mentioned that this is a construction which we wanted to deploy for lightweight applications so we need something which doesn't rely on any crypto heavy primitives also the other uh, caveat of having hash lock is like uh, it has a lot of on-chain footprint and at the same time it's like uh, it uh, sort of makes these two transaction correlated so suppose someone observes this transaction on bitcoin as well as on the monero side they can figure uh, correlate that these two transactions are somehow related and there was a swap so it violates privacy so uh, just a bit of a background i think this is this is redundant here because yeah like, most of the people are aware of how this monero uh, thing works 
so like if there's a, a address where you have locked your monero so one could view it using a so the secret has uh, key has two parts so one is the view key by which you can view whether this particular address has the given amount of uh, monero coin xmr coins or not and there's the spend key so spend key allows you to spend uh, monero from this particular address so i just give a brief background uh, because next i explain like how the secret sharing of the spend uh, key is used to ensure that you don't use time locks on the monero side but still you can realize the swap so i mean prior to our protocol there was a protocol by ol Google and uh, the people from combat network use this protocol with a bit of modification using uh, adapter signatures so they have deployed ethereum and monero swap on the uh, and it's uh, bitcoin and monero swap sorry my bad bitcoin and monero swap is deployed by the comet network people and it's uh, really working good but this construction which is discussed by google has certain caveats so let's first uh, uh, let's, uh, just go through briefly like how it works so google's protocol definitely uses an adapter signature so it's uh, not linkable and uh, like the hash hash based uh, atomic swap and also previously i mentioned that it uh, uh, relies on this two out of two secret sharing of the monero private spend key so in case alice and bob they want to undergo a swap uh, so what Al what they do is like bob Alice is going to lock her Monero in an address where the private send, uh, spend key is like uh, one half of the secret is with Alice and the other half is, is with Bob. So in case after Alice locks her coin, she, is, she cannot spend it directly without Bob's cooperation. So that prevents uh, Alice to just do a refund without Bob's knowledge. And also like even if she wants to do a refund then first bob should initiate a refund and release as part of the secret and only then alice can go for a refund and also this is a really good thing because monero side doesn't need a time lock and only bitcoin side there is a time lock and also the transactions in monero are fungible because no one can differentiate whether this is a swap transaction or a normal monero transaction so next let me explain like this adapter signature so I mean, the idea is very simple, like you have a normal signature as we do using, say, ECDSA or Schnorr, but what we do here is like condition the signature on a particular statement, which is uh, NP hard. And that is uh, given the statement, you do not know what's the witness and it's really hard to extract the witness from the statement. So here what I do is like a user statement Y. So you can consider that uh, uh, if you have to figure out the witness of why you mean I need to break the discrete log. So it's same as uh, breaking discrete log hardness. So once you pre-sign this transaction, so in order to make this uh, signature complete, you need to know the witness of the statement why, and only then the signature would be valid on this particular transaction. So this is adapter signature on a very high level and we make use of this primitive in our construction so also there are other parts uh, to it so now we see that monero and bitcoin are both are on different elliptic curves so like even though they make use of the same secret on both these curves uh, one has like either alice or bob they need to provide a proof that okay this uh, particular discrete log it's equal across the different groups so you know it's a proof of knowledge uh so to show that indeed the decommitment of these two statements would be the same and uh, so as i explain uh, it through a diagram it would be clear like where we would be needing these proofs and where how the secrets are released so uh, just let me discuss uh, on a very high level how uh, this uh, uh, google's uh, protocol works so i think this is a bit of a problem because i think the animations don't appear here because i've uploaded the slide but never mind so uh, here what happens is like once uh, bob is the uh, bob has to lock his monero and uh, uh, like bob uh, wants monero in exchange of alice's uh, bitcoins so what Al, uh, what bob will do is like uh, lock his monero uh, uh, and then uh, lock the bitcoins and in the next step uh, so as i mentioned that 
Alice uh, has to lock the Monero in an address where the secrets are shared. So like one half of the secret essay is with Alice and the other half of the secret SB is with Bob. So what they can do is like uh, now Bob also locks his Bitcoin. So as you can see the transaction on the upper side. So this could uh, Bob could uh, Bob now mentions this script like it has the two way of spending this Bitcoin. So one is the redeem and one is the cancel. So redeem part is like when Alice wants to redeem the Bitcoin, she will release her part of the secret essay. And once she redeems uh, her this Bitcoin, she will release the secret and that would allow uh, Bob to unlock the coins because he has the other part of the secret SP. And that ensures the swap uh, is uh, occurring successfully. In the And in the bad case, what can happen is like uh, Alice don't redeem this uh, Bitcoins then what she can do is uh, like what bob will do is like bob will initiate this cancel transaction after this timeout is over and then he would go for a refund publishing his part of the secret so i think this is similar to what the previous protocol yesterday was discussed so he releases his part of the secret and uh, bob gets back his bitcoins and alice using this uh, secret sp gets back her uh, monero which is locked in this two out of two secret shared address and in the bad case, what uh, in the other case, what can happen is like uh, Bob is not responding, so he is uh, does he doesn't even uh, publish this TX cancel. So what uh, Alice can do is Alice could go for a redeem, and then she sees that uh, Bob doesn't claim to the Monero. So uh, so in no way uh, uh, Bob. Uh, so uh, this Monero is sort of remaining stuck because now uh, Bob is not retrieving. And in the other case, what could happen is like Alice is not responding. Then in that case, Bob just uh, uh, publishes this TX cancel and he just waits for this uh, timeout and uh, sees that if uh, Alice is not responding, so he just unlocks it. So in some way or the other, like in some of the cases, uh, uh, Alice is dependent on Bob for the secret SB or vice versa. Like Bob is dependent on Alice for the secret SB. So this dependency sort of violates this like uh, safety property that anyone who is uh, locking the coins can unlock after a certain timeout period because uh, on the on Bob's side there's this time lock which allows him to withdraw the Bitcoin after a certain timeout, but on Alice's side she is dependent on Bob for the other part of the secret. So in case Bob is suffering a crash fault, Alice is doomed because she cannot retrieve her part of Monero. So that's the bad part of this construction. And also the other caveat of this construction is like Bob has to move first, locking his Bitcoins. So there could be this denial of service attack where Alice doesn't lock her Monero. In that case, Bob's uh, Bitcoin might be locked for the next 24 hours. So there is an opportunity cost uh, attached to this Bitcoins, which is not utilized for the next 24 hours. So here I just uh, re reiterate the drawbacks which I mentioned before. So in the case of Bob is uh, the service provider, it's really bad because he is keeping his Monero uh, Bitcoin locked for a long, very long duration. And also this dependency for a refund is uh, not good in terms of safety. So let us check like what our protocol does. It's uh, improves on Google's protocol. So here uh, Alice, the one who is locking Monero, she needs to move first. So and we allow her to refund anytime she wants instead of depending on uh, Bob for the refund. And also like once Bob observes that Alice has locked her coins, so he will lock his coin so he's not vulnerable to griefing attack. So redeem on the Bitcoin side has option of claim and emergency refund. So similar to what the Google's protocol does. But uh, here the thing is that if uh, Alice has a liberty to refund her Monero anytime, so this could be a problem. Like once Alice has initiated a redeem, she could uh, also publish a refund. But the thing is that the very moment she is allowed to redeem the Bitcoin, she cannot spend it. So there is a time lock involved. So within this time lock, if Bob sees that Alice has refunded her Monero, then that would lead Alice to reveal a secret. So that's why we need this adapter signature on uh, ring signature so that releases a secret and that would allow Bob to uh, immediately unlock the bitcoins by punishing this emergency by publishing the emergency refund and, and then Alice cannot claim the bitcoins 
So this is what I have explained in this figure is like uh, uh, how this transaction goes through. Like, for, so first Alice is locking her Monero and with the view keys, Bob observes whether the Monero is locked and then Bob is locking the Bitcoins. And here there are two ways of re uh, canceling or redeeming. So in the redeem phase now, th this is a reverse from what Google did. So now the cancel could be done instantly, like after this timeout. But in the redeem phase, that's what I mentioned, like uh, either uh, a secret is published when Alice publishes this redeem transaction and that allows Bob to redeem Monero at the more from the Monero chain. But in case what Alice does is like Alice first uh, publishes her refund transaction, then she will release a secret that is a uh, witness to this uh, statement RA. And uh, or if, if in the, at the same time she tries to publish this redeem transaction, then she cannot redeem the Bitcoin in, uh, instantly because she has to wait this uh, uh, relative time lock uh, T2. And after, uh, in between, like if uh, Bob is, uh, Bob sees that uh, this has, Monero has been refunded, so he publishes this witness to the statement RA and claims the uh, Bitcoins. So this is how the safety of the safety as well as liveness as well as atomicity of these transactions are maintained. So I think this is, uh, since the animations are not coming out properly, I think this would be a mess to explain, but I think this is a superimposition of the bad case and the good case, but I have explained it because uh, it's a uh, super easy way to uh, follow as uh, there's no dependency on the secret because now Alice can refund anytime she wants because this is a pre-signed ring transaction and she uh, ring signature and she uh, only she knows the secret. And on the other side, Bitcoin has a time lock, so Bob can refund it anytime. And uh, now the dependency is only on the redeem side. So in case uh, Alice wants to uh, redeem her uh, uh, Bitcoin, she publishes her part of the secret and Bob can claim the Monero from the other chain. So I'm not, uh, so details you can find in the paper, which is there on ePrint. And just let me give a highlight like this construction in its current form is uh, not possible because the key offset uh, is not available for generating a signature hash in Monero. So this pre-signing of uh, transactions in Monero is not possible now. And it is still a work in progress by the commit network people because this would enable a layer two protocols to be realized in the Monero network. And uh, uh, currently the only problem is like since you need the transactions to be on chain only then you can figure out like at what height your next pending transaction is so instead of that uh, we proposed a idea that you could go for a set of public keys instead of the key offsets in the ring members of the ring signature so that would require you to change the monero's code base so that's why we don't have a implementation which would which would allow you to uh, some overview regarding the time and the transaction size so this change of Monero code base is badly needed for realizing the layer two protocols. And once this is done, I think this atomic swap would be realized and it's also good, uh, it would be enabling lightweight atomic swap. And I just skim, uh, skim through quickly, like uh, all these things work perfectly since we assume that miners are honest. And the next uh, work in progress is like, we want to also how time lock bribing would work like miners collude with either Alice or Bob and then Alice uh, either offers a higher fee or Bob offers a higher fee and they enter a bidding war or something like that. And uh, so if like Alice has, gets the Monero Bitcoin from Bob and he now my, bribes the miners that to sure say that, okay, you just uh, fail his uh, reading transaction and allow me to refund. So this sort of this might lead to a bidding war because now Bob can also offer a higher fee and then try to fail Alice's transaction on the other chain. So there are a few works which discusses this time lock bribing and there's a paper called as Mad HTLC which uh, tries to prevent this uh, cheating in ha hash time lock contracts. Also there are follow up works like Helium HTLC and Rapid Dash which discusses like how you could prevent bribing attacks in atomic swap. But all these primitives work perfectly, assuming that you have this HTLC scripts in both the chain and how you can uh, incentivize miners to comply with the protocol and not collude with either of the party. But it's a tricky thing to realize this thing in Monero, which the, there's no time lock. 
So this is currently what we are doing. And I think I'm a bit over the time, so let me end my presentation. And also, thanks for that for your time. You can reach out to us, so like the Philip, me, Pedro, Shushmita, and also we'll be happy to answer your questions now, or also over email, or you can uh, connect to us on Twitter. And yeah, with this I end my presentation. So thank you.